Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar, Copyright Issues for Legislative Audiences, Copyrights and Copy Wrongs. I'm Mary Camp, Director of the Texas Legislative Reference Library. Today's webinar is jointly sponsored by the Legislative Research Librarian Staff Section and the Legal Services Staff Section. On behalf of the officers of LRL and Legal Services, and as the immediate past chair of LRL, I'd like to welcome all of you to our session today. Funding for the webinar was made possible by an e-learning grant from NCSL Foundation for State Legislatures and the Legislative Staff Coordinating Committee. Today, today's webinar is being recorded and will post the recording on NCSL's website within two weeks so that you can review the session or share it with your colleagues who are not able to participate in today's event. We'll also make copies of the slides used in today's presentation available online. We have more than 60 attendees from 30 states participating in today's webinar. Whether you are a legislative drafter, researcher, or librarian, you are likely to face copyright questions in your work. Copyright is covered by a complex series of intellectual property laws designed to protect the rights of authors in their work for both published and uh, unpublished materials. Under federal and state copyright laws, with limited exceptions, authors have the exclusive right to reproduce or distribute their work and can sue users who violate their rights without permission or who fail to compensate them for use of the material. Legislative staff often have to deal with copyright questions over what constitutes a fair use exception for materials or to what extent which materials are in the public domain and may be shared with the public. Today we'll explore state and federal copyright laws and requirements as well as review exceptions that would apply to legislative use of materials. We're fortunate to have with us today two legislative staff attorneys who will share their expertise on copyright issues. Kristen Ford serves as the legislative librarian for the Idaho Legislative Reference Library. She obtained a JD from the University of Idaho and a Master's in Library and Information Science from the University of Washington. She is a member of the Idaho and Alaska State Bars. She has served as the Legislative Librarian for the Idaho Legislature since 1999. During the past decade, Kristen has authored several articles which were published in the Legal Reference Services Quarterly. She contributed, contributed to an article researching uniform model laws that appeared in West Group perspective, teaching, legal research, and writing. She also authored an article with two Idaho senators on the judicial use of legislative history that was published in the Idaho Law Review. John Heine serves as the general counsel for the Texas Legislative Council. John joined the Texas Legislative Council in 2006 and as general counsel provides legal support to the Legislative Council for administrative, contractual, and personnel issues. In addition, he drafts bills for, for and provides legal advice to the Texas Legislature. Prior to that, he served as the Council for Public Policy in the office of the Texas Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst. John graduated summa cum laude from the Auburn University with a BBA and subsequently earned his Juris Doctor degree from the University of Texas School of Law. Adding to his legal studies, he later earned a Master's of Laws degree from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And now with that, we'll start with uh, Kristen. Good afternoon. I'm Kristen Ford, and I'm the librarian for the Idaho Legislature. I'm here because Eddie Weeks has taken my family hostage, <laughs> or at least that's what I would have said a few months ago. I admit to being one of those people that had such a dread of copyright issues that I would just try not to use anything questionable in order to avoid the whole copyright question. I didn't exactly know much about copyright, but I had the notion that it was about property rights for an author. But what I learned is that copyright is not property law for authors. Rather, copyright law is all about society's determination that there should be balance between protecting an author's rights and the free flow and exchange of ideas. This puts librarians squarely in the center. I mean, that's why we are librarians, right? Because we believe in and we want to facilitate the free flow and exchange of ideas. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. 
But for now, let's take a quick look back at the history of copyright. It didn't start with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, nor even the Copyright Act of 1976. The law and the values espoused by copyright are very, very old. When the printing press was invented, it was pretty much the publishers that had rights to a work. They would purchase a work from an author, and then it was theirs to print and sell, and the author no longer had any rights nor received any further money for the work, no matter how many copies sold. But beginning in 1710 in Old England, a law was passed giving authors property rights in their works, but only for certain time periods and with certain limitations. My favorite part of this old law was the penalties part. It states that anyone found in unlawful possession of copies of a work could be fined and that their copy of the work should be made into waste paper. I had no idea waste paper was a term that was used in the 1700s. When the United States wrote its first copyright law in 1790, it was very similar to the law enacted by the English 80 years earlier except it specifically added maps and charts as well as books to be given copyright protection. And to my disappointment, it didn't use the term waste paper. Since the statute of Anne and George Washington's copyright law, U.S. copyright law, of course, has been rewritten and modified. The idea of overall balance between property rights for authors and society's interest in the free flow and exchange of ideas hasn't changed. The most significant changes have been to the sorts of publications the Act applies to. So in other words, it now applies to music, movies, plays, internet publications, etc. And the length of time before an author's exclusive rights expire. It used to be in 1710 that an author had exclusive rights for 14 years, and they could renew for another 14 years for a 28-year maximum. Now that period of time before a work goes into the public domain has significantly expanded, probably to benefit heirs. So it's now life plus 70 years, or for a corporate author, 120 years. Unfortunately, determining whether a work's copyright has expired is not just a mathematical equation. Because U.S. copyright requirements changed so much during the 20th century, you have to know the copyright law at the time the work was first published. There used to be requirements for notice and renewal that we don't have in current law. Fortunately, there's a very cool tool online, thanks in part to the American Library Association, that will help you figure out copyright status. It's an interactive tool where you can move get my little thing here. You can move this arrow right here up and down to the date of the publication. And at the same time, these two fields here will change according to the date of your publication. And then you can click on them for further information once it's, once it's uh, determined the year of your publication. So that's pretty cool. The U.S. Copyright Office also has a really helpful website. There's a lot of great information in the Frequently Asked Questions, and their Circular 21 publication, it's great. It's great. It's aimed at educators and librarians. It even includes a lot of the legislative history of the copyright law, including excerpts from Senate and House reports, and discussions from the Congressional record. It even cited in its examples of fair use a, quote, reproduction of a work in legislative or judicial proceedings or reports. This got me very excited and set me off on case law research for uh, copyright um, claims for legislative proceedings. And unfortunately, I didn't come up with any, but again, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, in addition to information and background about copyright law generally, they also have a searchable database of registered copyright works from 1978 to the present. This could be useful if you have determined that a work is copyrighted, but you want to find out where to get permission to use it. And for copyrighted works before 1978, Google Books has scanned the U.S. Copyright Office's catalog. Uh, I see that I forgot to include the web address for this portal, but if you Google the title searching Google scans of the catalog of copyright entries, it will come right up for you. Or if anyone is taking notes, the web address is http colon backslash books.google.com slash googlebooks slash copyright search dot html.
So one thing I wondered working in a legislative environment like we do is how do public records laws interact with copyright law? Does one trump the other? Well, there's no easy yes or no answer. Like so much in law, it really depends on the facts of an individual case and the individual court hearing it. The two laws coexist and are not mutually exclusive. What are the ways public record issues can come up? Well, first of all, can the government claim copyright in its work? The federal government definitely can't. They are specifically accepted, exempted by the U.S. copyright law. State government may be a little different. Some states, like Idaho, claim a copyright in its statutes. So, as legislative staff, if we create a work, can we claim a copyright in it? We could try, and we might even win. There's not a whole lot of case law out there on it. But because we've created the work in the course of our employment, it's considered a work for hire, and the copyright belongs to our employer and not to us individually. Another way in which the interaction of these two laws could cause us trouble is if a private party's copyrighted work is brought to a legislative committee hearing. Uh, for example, if you have a research report, it might become an attachment to committee minutes. I know they do here in Idaho. Um, do we allow a member of the public to copy it, or do we put it on the Internet if our, copy minute, if our committee minutes are online? I couldn't find any court cases of state legislative records coming up in this way, but there are some similarities to some county record cases which I've cited for you on this slide. The agency, or us, we should still do the copyright analysis. Being part of a public record does not free us from that duty. In the situation I posed a moment ago, I would allow a patron to copy it under the fair use or library exemption, but I would not post it online without permission because then your audience is not restricted to an educational use or private research. This takes us in to the actual analysis a person needs to do when a copyright issue comes up. The first step is to determine whether the work or the proposed use of the work is covered by copyright. Since if it's not, you can skip all the other steps. The U.S. copyright law, by the way, is under Title 17 of the U.S. Code. Uh, Section 101 is definitions. Sections 102 through 105 cover what type of information is copyrightable. Section 106 talks about the uses that copyright protects. Section 107 covers fair use exceptions, and then libraries and archives have their own additional exceptions under Section 108. So in this instance, if, for example, the work was before 1923, then you don't need to go any further because it's expired from its copyright term. Or, for example, if it's not a creative work, if it's just, for example, a list of materials, then that's not covered by copyright. Um, or if the purpose is not covered by copyright, if all you want to do is read it, not copy it or distribute it, then that's not subject to a copyright analysis because that's not a violation. That's not a um, protected uh, use. So on this slide, I just have um, some of the Section 108 exceptions for copyright, and I would suggest that if your situation comes under one of these, um, private research and study would probably come up quite a bit, or preservation copy, I know we do a lot. Um, if it comes under that, go ahead and use that because that's a lot more specific than fair use. Um, if none of these categories covers your situation, then you'll need to um, go through the fair use analysis under Section 107. And the U.S. Code sets out four factors. All are meant to be balancing factors, and no one factor is dispositive. There's a book called Copyright Law for Librarians and Educators, Creative Strategies and Practical Solutions by Kenneth Cruz, that's C-R-E-W-S. And it's a really helpful book. It also provides some sample checklists or forms to help librarians balance factors and, and document that that balancing took place. So when you're going through these factors, you always want to keep the original intent of copyright balance in mind. So the first factor is purpose or character of the use. So for example, is it a commercial purpose or is it a nonprofit educational purpose? Commercial purpose is more likely to be found infringing than a nonprofit since the whole purpose of the copyright is to facilitate the free exchange of ideas and promote learning. Um, obviously, nonprofit educational purposes are going to weigh more heavily in favor of that use. And according to an analysis of court decisions done in a recent law review article by Neil Weinstock Netanel, it's called Making Sense of Fair Use. Courts are trending toward approving transformative uses like parodies and song sampling.
the nature of the copyrighted work is the second element. Um, for example, is it an unpublished work or already published? The courts have given more protection to unpublished works because they feel that the authors didn't have any intention of it being out there in the public domain. And then again, nonfiction is more likely um, than fiction to be found as fair use because once again, getting back to that original um, intent of fostering knowledge and learning. The third factor, the amount of the work being used has been subject to some misunderstanding. Some institutions will adopt their own fair use policy guidelines so that not everyone working in the library has to be knowledgeable about copyright. To play it safe and keep things simple, they might arbitrarily pick a number and say, okay, you can't copy more than 10% of a work or more than one chapter from a book or more than one article from a journal. But this can be a misguided rule because it can lead you away from the real um, balance analysis that should be done in fair use. So for example, there are situations in which it might be fair use to use an entire work. Um, on the other hand, there, there, have, there was at least one court case that I saw where there was just a small excerpt taken, but it really um, got the whole core of the work, and so the court did find that, that was a violation of fair use. So you have to always remember to keep the whole picture in mind. This last factor is probably a little easier to quantify. Whose pocketbook are you hurting? So are you replacing a marketplace purchase or is the material otherwise pretty much unavailable? There's a great new trend that I also want to make sure you know about. You might see these little uh, CC symbols on the bottom of web pages or other works. And it doesn't stand for closed captioning, like I thought. Creative Commons is a movement toward allowing authors to indicate what sorts of uses they want to allow in their copyright works. It's not a replacement for copyright law, but rather a way of supplementing their rights. In other words, instead of not allowing any uses of their copyrighted works or giving up all their copyrights, authors can indicate which uses they're fine with, and then they don't have to be peppered with permission requests from multiple folks. Each symbol represents a type of use allowed or not allowed. And I realize these are a little bit small here, but if you go to the Creative Commons website, you'll be able to see them a little better. All of them require attributing your work to you, but then other uses may restrict to non-commercial uses, for example, or they may say you can use their work so long as you share and share alike and grant your final work product the same sharing uses that they did. So these are really more in the nature of license agreements but it kind of facilitates the flow of ideas since you don't have to stop and contact the author individually, but the author's already announced what sorts of uses they're fine with. Another great movement is by institutions to make easily available on the web works that they feel confident are in the public domain and no longer copyrighted. Some of these are art, like this National Gallery of Art site. Some may be books, and I know there are many other sites like this one. This is just one example. Project Gutenberg is a great one for audiobooks also. And there's also a number of sites that guide you to other sites with works in the public domain. Public Domain Sherpa is one, that's S-H-E-R-P-A. And I also like this site by publicdomainreview.org. So they have a list of places where you can get um, public domain um, books and photographs and art all sorts of things. And Flickr, Flickr has a, um, under their commons, flickr.com slash commons, they have a nice searchable collection of photos. Um, but you do have to be careful on this site and others because some of them may have some creative commons or other restrictions that you need to abide by. So always check the fine print um, on the bottom of, underneath each photo. It will tell you which uses are allowed and which are not. But usually if they're on here, at least some uses are permitted. All right, so realistically we could spend a day or a week on copyright. And these were just these resources that I just showed you are just a few of the, the help that's out there for um, for us as authors and for us as librarians um, in navigating the whole copyright thing. But since we I have a half hour instead, I just want to leave you with some other resources on copyright law. This is a really um, pretty nifty timeline on dipity.com. 
and it shows um, all major events in the timeline of, of copyright law. And yes, it goes all the way back to the statute of Anne, so that's kind of cool. And then you can just click on uh, each event to bring up more information about it. And it includes things like um, major court cases as well as um, congressional acts and, and uh, major industries doing XYZ. So that's pretty neat. And for a very readable, not dry and boring book on the whole philosophy behind copyright, I recommend this book, which you can purchase or you can download for free with the author's full blessing. He puts it right on his site. It's The Public Domain by James Boyle. And I wouldn't have thought there could have been exciting, interesting reads on copyright, but, but his is really kind of fun to read. And now I've probably lost all credibility with you guys. So to recap, I think it's important to not be a librarian like I was and just say no or avoid using things because it might be restricted by copyright. It's an unnecessary inhibition of our creative flow and that of our patrons. It's important to support the inseparable yin-yang of copyright. Without author protection, there's less incentive for those authors to produce. And with the decline in creative works production, there's less flow of creativity and ideas that stimulates others in turn. So I really think these two forces support and complement each other. Uh, librarians have a duty to support both copyright protections and fair use exemptions equally, all part of the same thing. And now I'm going to turn you over to John for an in-depth real-life case study. John? Hello, everyone. This is John Heining. And I'm going to talk to you about a journey that I had with regard to copyright law. I want to introduce you to one of the excellent publications that the Legislative Reference Library here in Texas produces. It is uh, originally started out as their clipping repository. It started out in 1900. They started collecting um, clippings of newspaper articles that uh, might be interested, interesting to uh, constituents and to the members of the legislature. In uh, 1976, the reference library was requested to start producing those, uh, those clips and providing them to all of the members of the legislature on a daily basis. So that means that clippers at the reference library arrive about 4.30 in the morning, five days a week, and distribute those clips by 7.30. Um, it's a really, really excellent um, uh, document, and you know, hundred, literally hundreds of folks were receiving it in the mid-2000s. Um, it was excellent for a number of reasons. First of all, it was curated, so we had we had people who really knew about state government. They knew what was uh, what was useful and what people wanted to know. It was organized in a predictable format. So if a member was interested in whether or not a particular issue that he was interested in was getting editorial treatment somewhere, or if a member thought he had made news and he wanted to find out, he could go and find that in a specific place in the cliffs every day. Um, moreover, uh, it was really just impractical. It, you know, we in Texas we have districts that are absolutely massive and might have dozens of newspapers found within those districts, and it was just impractical to have somebody go through each newspaper in each member office and and find something. And of course, with the elimination of uh, duplicative effort, there was also taxpayer savings associated with that. There we go. And uh, the problem, though, came um, in the last year or so. There's been a, a real uh, uh, pressure to modernize for the reference library. Uh, the uh, paper distribution uh, limited uh, copyright concerns uh, for the most part for them, and except in 2003, we had a very bad budget year. And rather than eliminate FTEs, uh, uh, the reference library decided to eliminate paper distribution of their clips. The uh, the issue of whether or not they were they were distributing copyrighted material uh, uh, too broadly was addressed by the fact that they that you could only access the clips 
on campus on the legislative intranet. They're using a state computer. So it was still the universe of people who were able to access these clips remained pretty much the same. Um, the problem has come with members getting a little bit more sophisticated in the fact that they know, well, hey, you know, if you can post a PDF up on your website, then you can send me a PDF to me on my computer at home, and I can read it at 7.30 in the morning while I'm eating my chocolate co cocoa puffs at my desk or in my, uh, my breakfast nook there. So uh, there's a real interest in making these clips more available to people uh, outside of the Capitol and off campus. Um, problem there, of course, is that when you're talking about electronic document and potentially posting that electronic document on the uh, on the web, well, you know that the distribution is no longer going to be limited. And what's more, um, the extent of the permissions that were granted to the reference library in 1976 when they first started. Doing these, uh, doing these clippings and dis distributing them to the members is not at all clear. Um, it, they, they've basically been lost to history. And so we're really not sure if they were written, we don't have them anymore, and if they were verbal, then those people you know, aren't around anymore. So, so uh, uh, Mary approached uh, Legislative Council and asked, uh, asked us if we had any attorneys over here who had any experience in copyright law. And of course, this is not something that we deal with on a regular basis. And we decided that we didn't really have anybody that knew anything. And um, being an attorney who doesn't know anything about a lot of things, they thought I would be perfect to address this issue. So first thing I did was I tried to figure out, how bad is it? You know, it, are, we, are we, as a state entity, are we covered by the, um, by the copyright law? Well, sure enough, you read this little section here from uh, 17 U.S.C. section 511, I, yep, sure looks like it. So, all right, well, that's bad. Um, so does it qualify under fair use, uh, as a fair use, uh, this distribution of the clips? Well, um, if you look at the fact that we could be buying newspapers, Instead of instead of having one newspaper subscription that gets copied, you know, a thousand times, we could have, you know, I don't know, 200 newspaper subscriptions. Yeah, you know, that 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 competition element kind of looks kind of bad there. And then, uh, in addition to that, you know, we are printing all of the, all of this material. So, it, it, fair use, at least the typical fair use analysis, it, it's kind of questionable about whether or not it applies. So I decided to go deeper. I did some research into um, into kind of the legislative history of copyright, and because I'm thinking, well, you know, there might be some exemptions for legislatures and and, and state agencies with regard to this issue. So uh, I found this great quote from a from a report on the revision of the copyright law from 1961. It says, "Reproduction of a work in legislative or judicial proceedings reports it's fair use." Well, fantastic, right? That that seems like that applies. Well, no, I, I don't think so. I think you know we're we're talking about clips. We're talking about things that legislators might be reading just because they find interesting. Maybe not necessarily associated with bill that's going to get filed. I think when this report was was what this report was talking about was really uh, you know maybe copyrighted material that might be found in a legislative uh, legislative report or copyright material that might have been reprinted because it was submitted as witness testimony, that type of thing. All right, so then we went and talked about the library exception. And you know, you know this, this initially made me feel pretty good. So you, you, look, you say, okay, the reproduction or distribution is made without any purpose of commercial advantage. Sure, okay, we're a state agency, no commercial advantage. Uh, the collections of the library are open to the public. Yes, they are. Uh, the reproduction or distribution of the work includes a notice of copyright. We can do that, no problem at all. Um, the problem is that when then you start talking, you start looking at it as one copy. Um, okay, well we make a lot more than one copy. No more than one article. Um, well, we certainly uh, the the clips might use multiple multiple articles from a single newspaper if the newspaper particularly has a has a real interesting issue. So probably not, probably not the library exception either. So what did I do? Well, I thought, well, 
you know, other states probably have dealt with this issue before. And, you know, what is one organization that deals with other states all the time? Well, that's NCFL. So I called Kay Warnark, and I, and I told her my, my issue here and, and explained to her what I was looking for. And she pointed me towards Seminole Tribe versus Florida. And uh, basically what this case is, is, is it's under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. And, it, and the Indian Gam Gambling Regulatory Act requires states to negotiate in good faith regarding gam gaming compacts. And if they refuse to do that, then it uh, provides that the tribe can uh, sue the state in federal court. So what ends up happening is this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court when Florida refuses to negotiate. And uh, the Supreme Court says, no, under the 11th Amendment, uh, the, the uh, Congress is prohibited from using its Article I powers to abrogate state sovereign immunity. So, okay, well, that's cool. We're talking about Indian gaming. So, well, let, let's talk about and let's look at the Article I powers. Okay, re regulate uh, the, the Indian tribes, uh, provide and maintain ma Navy right. Oh, wait, establish copyrights, trademarks, and patents. So here you have right here the beginning of where it looks like perhaps the states are not actually subject to copyright, but it gets better. In a case called Florida Prepaid uh, versus uh, College Savings Bank, basically what happened here is this New Jersey bank had a method for administering education savings plans, and uh, Florida just copied it despite the fact that the bank had patented, patented it. And uh, so the bank sued, and uh, and they rather than arguing that the uh, that they were able to obtain relief under Article One of the Constitution, they were arguing that oh no 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 Article One is applied to the states uh, under the Fourteenth Amendment, and the Supreme Court came back and says well all right maybe, but there are two things that you have to you have to get through here they're they're, they're Two, two doors that you have to walk through. The first is that the 11th Amendment requires Congress to indicate, to, to intend to abrogate state immunity very, and they need to make that statement very clearly. That was provided for in the patent law. But in addition to that, the, uh, this abrogation of state, immun of state sovereign immunity is, uh, must be pursuant, pursuant to a valid exercise of power. Well, what's a valid exercise of pattern, power? Well. Basically, what has to happen is that the Congress has to identify a wrong being committed by the states and work to remediate that wrong under its powers granted by the 14th Amendment. Uh, Supreme Court came back and said, well, there is no power, uh, and there, there is no pattern of infringement here. There, there's no, uh, there were no witnesses or very few witnesses, very few incidences of uh, patent infringement presented to Congress by, in, regarding the states, and uh, let alone was there a pattern of constitutional violations. So, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, College Savings Bank, but you lose. So um, it gets better. Uh, we go to my home state here in Texas, and Denise Chavez, she's a nationally renowned playwright and dramatist. She contracts with the University of Houston Publishing Division, which is called Arte Publico Press. Incidentally, the University of Houston is a, um, is a, a state university. And in 1986, she contracts for, for a publication of hers to be pro produced by Arte Publico called The Last Menu of Girl, or The Last of the Menu Girls. And uh, she's not happy with it. Um, the, the press basically doesn't correct some errors that are found in the publication. So she basically comes out in 1991 and says, hey, no more. Um, I, I think our contract is over, and I don't want you to produce any more additional copies of the book. Uh, University of Houston comes back and says, no, actually, we think under our contract that we have permission to print 5,000 more copies. So we're going to do it. And in 1993, uh, Ms. Chavez sues. The Fifth Circuit here in Texas says, well, um, based on Seminole Tribe and Florida prepaid, uh, uh, you have to get, jump through some hoops here in order, to, in order to demonstrate that the state is at all subject to copyright law. And uh, first of all, you know, 11th Amendment protects for, for basically Article I entirely. 
And then, again, there's no proof of a pattern of state infringement to justify remediation of the 14th Amendment. So they dismiss, and uh, Ms. Chavez, Ms. Chavez loses uh, the state, uh, save, save some money. <clears throat> and this holding has been adopted by uh, a number of other courts here from Utah all the way to, to New York and California. So, you know, it seems to be pretty popular. And what's more, it's a one-sided arrangement. Here you have a picture of a starving artist, Daniel Moore, and uh, what his shtick is, is to paint key plays of, uh, for the University of Alabama football team and sell these paintings. University of Alabama sues, saying, well, you're infringing on our copyright, you're infr infringing on our patent. <clears throat> and so, um, you, know, you know, you need to pay us some money. And uh, University of Alabama actually lost this suit, but it wasn't because they didn't own the patent or didn't own the copyrights in their uniforms. Rather, uh, they, Mr. Moore successfully argued that his work was sufficiently transformational to constitute a new work that, that wasn't infringing. So what are you telling me, John? On one side, you're telling me that there is no liability for the states for copyright. And on the other side, you're telling me that the states can sue and enforce their own copyright? Yes. Yes, I'm telling you that. And so woohoo. It doesn't really matter what we do. We can just, uh, you know, shoot our guns in the air and ride out into the West and infringe on copyright wherever we want to go. It doesn't matter, right? Um, and obviously, there's some <coughs> some possibilities here. For example, my agency might be able to balance its budget by uh, producing cut rate copies of Harry Potter books. Um, the Senate might be able to pay for, you know, a nice holiday meal or something like that by publishing copies of the most popular album ever made. And, you know, there's no reason to stick with the classics here. Uh, Reference Library could produce other works there. <coughs> but I want you to consider some issues here before you go, go and do that. The first is that uh, injunctive relief might be available uh, under a case called Ex Parte Young. We won't go into it in any detail here, but basically what ends up happening is the individual state employee is sued for injunctive relief to require them to, no, to, to not publish the infringing work anymore. And then also, uh, you know, it might result in the possible destruction of the infringing material. That's a possibility. It's not very clear whether or not it applies, but certainly a possibility. Uh, there are state laws that provide copyright protect protection, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then in addition, uh, the Supreme Court may change its mind. This, uh, both the Seminole case and and the college finance case, were both 5-4 Ren Rehnquist uh, decisions. Um, so, you know, depending on the the constitution of the court, uh, these things might flip back and forth. In addition, by infringing on copyright, you are providing evidence to Congress to reenact the Copyright Trademark and Patent Statute, and this time it might stick because it'll be based on evidence. Uh, finally, <coughs> another issue that, uh, that you have to consider as well is just harassment suits. Just because uh, somebody knows they're going to lose doesn't mean that they can't file a lawsuit, and depending on how your state is provided with, uh, with uh, um, defense, uh, legal defense, uh, you or your agency might be responsible for paying quite a bit of money uh, to, to obtain that defense for at least to get to the summary judgment uh, part of the lawsuit. Um, and then in addition to that, courts don't always agree with, that, with the, the Chavez, uh, in, in the Chavez uh, uh, decision and, and may not apply Seminole Tribe correctly. In this case here in Georgia, uh, the Georgia State University was uh, basically what was happening is the library for Georgia State University was posting scholarly articles at the request of professors onto their website so that they could um, so, so that students could go and re read those articles and the publisher of those articles or one of the publishers of the articles uh, sued saying that this was an infringement and um, the court, I think she, I, I think the judge misapplied the, the tests involved. 
but she came out and said that there was no state immunity uh, under Seminole Tribe and under the, the um, college finance cases. Um, now, she did, however, find that, these, and that the use of this material was not infringing, and, she, and it was because of a, a rather interesting process that the uh, Georgia, uh, University of Georgia system uh, applies, and we'll get to that in just a minute. <coughs> so those are the legal issues. You also want to consider the contractual issue, or consider some of the more practical issues. For example, uh, uh, people, uh, entities that produce uh, uh, copyright works might obtain contractual remedies uh, against you, and moreover, if you don't uh, if you don't accept the contractual remedies, they may not want to contract with your agency, or because one of some other state agency, uh, not yours, uh, engages in regular uh, um, violation of copyright, they may not want to copyright with your agency. Uh, another real limiting factor is that if you do. Uh, misuse copyright uh, uh, copyright material, you can't transfer or li license that copyrighted material if it becomes part of another work that you're producing. So let's say that you have a really excellent book, but it contains uh, infringing material. You can't then license it to somebody else because it's still infringing. Of course, public perception is an issue, and finally, you know, it's just flat unethical and unfair to infringe like that. So. Going back to the LRL, how are things looking for them? Well, the, there are a couple of things to consider here. The first is that you know, the members of the legislature are opinion leaders here in Texas, and Mary's uh, publication is an, a, just a fantastic publication. So when it comes to issues of use, uh, copyright holders are much more upset that they're not included in Mary's clips than uh, if they are included in Mary's Club. So I think they probably are just fine just because of the quality of the work and the audience that it's produced for. But that doesn't mean that they can't be proactive. Um, uh, one of the things that they can, what they can and are doing is they're copying the library exemption to the extent possible that, you know, based on their, on their uh, business processes. And uh, they're reducing copies when possible. And also, they're using some really neat technology to minimize or avoid infringement entirely. Uh, this one here is this is a screenshot of my uh, Outlook page there, for which uh, is uh, following RSS feeds. And if you know what an RSS feed is, it's a um, it's basically you can subscribe to an address. And it will provide you with uh, with content. Uh, the content provider can provide you with content so that you can just follow follow their website, follow their blog, follow their Facebook page without ha having to go and visit it constantly. So what you do, what so that's what this looks like here. And you, we've got all, just a list of articles that were in the clips for uh, December 10th here. And uh, if you click on, say, this article, "Branch to Speak at Texas State Commencement," right here. Um, this comes up, and it's literally a clip from uh, from the LRL's clips. There, um, this looks very much like a high tech version of the library copyright, copyright exception that is provided for in the uh, in the copyright statute, the federal copyright stat statute. Very, very close. Another one here, uh, which is really neat, uh, is used. You, it's best you, best access through iPad, using their a, the uh, an app called Flipboard here. And what it is is uh, the LRL has a Twitter feed where they copy and paste the addresses for all of the articles that they're that they find interesting for that day, and then you know, onto the Twitter feed. And you can subscribe to it with this application on an iPad, and it gives this kind of beautiful book style um, uh, presentation. And when you go and click at, on a story, say the story right there under the red arrow, then the uh, the actual newspaper's website comes up. So it's really it's just a, a really neat system, and I don't think that this is infringing at all. I you know this and this is really putting the LRL into the position that it wants to be in as a consolidator of information and, and you know, making that information available to everybody, but not actually publishing that information. 
And then finally, we're going back to that Georgia State University case here. What the uh, University of Georgia system was doing was they had a four-factor uh, checklist that whenever a professor wanted to post a work onto uh, the, the uh, Georgia State University's website, uh, they had to go through the and to to go through the checklist and submit it and submit it to the to the library that hey I think that this is a fair use a non infringing non infringing use of the work and you can see their checklist right here and the the um, the judge when she reviewed all of you know is literally a couple hundred use, uh, scholarly articles that had been published on the website because they had gone and used this checklist. With every one of these uh, of these uh, works that had been submitted, she basically she put a uh, uh, she considered none of those works or very very few of those works, maybe five or seven of them, to have been infringing. So uh, so very useful, very very helpful. And you can see the uh, the address of that checklist down here. Now that's all I have. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you both for an excellent presentation, sharing your expertise on the copyright issues. Um, I'd like to welcome questions at this time, too. I don't show any at this time. If you would like to submit a question or comment, you may use the chat box located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click on the Send button. Barbara, I think I can respond to that question. We we actually did consider the use of, uh, of security limitations for PDF documents. The problem is is that those security limitations are pretty easily defeated, and uh, <coughs> they only interact with certain types of software. So it, it wasn't it wasn't going to be a very and and moreover, they interfered with the access of the PDFs by certain types of software. So, uh, so it really wasn't a good, uh, a, a good solution. And I just had a question here. What was that question? It was about the security limits on PDF documents as a way to limit access. The next question we have is the use of photocopies of newspaper articles uh, in the bill present in a bill presentation. And I'm not sure I understand that question. John, does that? Ring a bell with you. Well, yeah, I, th I think that would that would count as as uh, submitting the work as part of testimony, as part of as part of legislative testimony, and at least if you're going to going to base it on that uh, that uh, congressional article where they were discussing you know fair use, you know that that certainly seems like that would be fair use to me. And our next question is, where will these slides and audio files be available online? And I believe they'll be on the NCSL website. Is that correct? Yes. Is that your understanding, Kristen? Okay. Yes, that's my understanding too. Um, let's see. Our next question is: We've been told unofficially that we can copy the text of our code, but not the annotations. Do you all agree with that, or would that be different for each state? I think that um, if you're talking about, you know, West publishing or, or Lexis doing annotations of your code, then that's I think that's correct. You know, their their summarizing of the case holdings would definitely be creative works that they could hold a copyright over. Um, if it was text, I mean, I don't know if your state does their own annotations or if it was text taken directly from the cases, then I think that you couldn't, you couldn't let restrict that. John, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I, I agree with that completely. Okay, our next question is, can copyrighted documents, uh, construction manuals adopted by reference in administrative rules be distributed to the public from a website? John, do you want to take that one? Sure. I, I think I think that's a very fact specific question, and I, I would hesitate to to say one way or the other about that. Um, I, I, I 
really think that would be something that you'd really want to look at that specific publication and the context of the distribution and, and kind of make a determination from there. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. That, that sounds like that would be um, a copyrighted material, so I would preferably would be to get the, the permission, but um, absent permission, I think that no, I think distributing on the website would be would be probably a violation. I think if you were to buy a copy and say there's a copy, you know, on file with our administrative rules coordinator, that would be one thing. But to distribute it unlimited to the public, I think would probably be an infringement. And our next question is: So the Texas Legislative Library allow? So is the Texas Legislative Library allowed to send the clip as a whole document to all members of the legislature? John, do you want to answer that, or do you want me to? Well, I, I, you're, you're the expert. <laughs> we still do not do that. We make it available electronically, and they can print it. Each member can print it in their office uh, as a PDF document, but we still do not uh, hand it to them or put it out there. But what I, what I would add to that, though, too, is because of the different formats that you're distributing in it right. in. The, the need for it, the justification for producing that document and sending it to, to members via email is significantly less. Correct. That's true. We also do a value add as a library. We read each clip and we link bills, reports, lawsuits, whatever is talked about in the, in the article, and that can be found on our website as well. So if you, it mentions a bill, you can go to that bill, or if it mentions a report or a lawsuit, we've linked that so it's a value added to go see supporting documentation to that clip. The next one is, what about a library collection of digital documents collected from various sites? Kristen, do you want to? Well, I think, you know, again, you're going to you're gonna have to look at each, each document. I mean, hopefully each document has been, you know, collected legitimately and not in violation of fair use. The, I don't think the, a collection of them is going to be any different than you know each one individually as far as doing that fair use analysis. Okay, and next we ask, could someone speak to the actual technology that limits the audience viewing news clips to legislators slash legislative staff, or is there really no problem to broadening access? Well, the technology that we use here in Texas is basically if you're logging in to the LRL's website from somewhere that is not the state capitol on a state capitol official computer, then you can't see it. So um, now I, I think that there is some liability uh, with regard to this if we if we don't if those permissions don't exist and you know if somebody doesn't want to have the uh, the document distributed in the fashion that the LRL distributes it. I, I think there's p potential that it's infringing, but I, you know, uh, Mary, I, I think you and I we've, we've talked about this, and that you know, if somebody doesn't want to have their documents on our uh, on the clips, um, then y'all just take them off, right? Exactly. In fact, this next question kind of talks about that too. It's saying, have any Texas papers instituted paywalls, and how does that work with the clips? And since we are tweeting clips, we are starting to hit paywalls. And we are in the process of contacting that newspaper to see if we can work out a subscription so that we don't have to pay per issue, so to speak, or per article. And if they uh, don't want us to participate or don't want us to put it up there, we simply will drop them from the clipping service. So that's right where we are in the middle of all this, is kind of renegotiating all that. Uh, the next question comes about cop what copyright does state legislature hold in the video footage that the legislator films of a public legislative proceeding? I think that's going to you know vary by each you know state's laws. Um, I think Idaho would probably claim every right in that um, as a you know, along with in, in Idaho, it's it's filmed by the Idaho Public Television, so I, I think that they would probably have co-rights in that. But I understand that some states are not as aggressive about asserting um, copyright in their state work, so I think that would probably vary from state to state. I agree. Yeah, you know, Texas, we're we're a lot loosey-goosey on <laughs> on whether or not 
you know, they're really whether or not we assert copyright and whether or not we, we really feel like we have it in the works that we produce here. Our next question is, do you know if the look or arrangement of items on a website can be copyrighted? And I think it probably can is if that's a you know the the creative threshold for being copyrightable is is pretty low. You know, you can't have a list of ingredients be copyrighted, but if you start you know putting a little information about how to mix those ingredients together, then then that's creative enough. And so I think that you probably could. I, I agree. there there are actually cases that the that that specific issue has been successfully litigated by by the the original owner of the website layout. Okay, and our next question is, if a state legislature registers a copyright covering all original works its staff create, annotations, editor notes, source notes, indices, etc., is it misleading or inaccurate to note the word copyright 2012, for example, on the first page of a statute book, even though the public domain law is not intended to be covered by the copyright? Should that notation be clarified or limited in some way? to indicate that the copyright is not intended to cover what is in the public domain. My opinion is that it wouldn't be necessary because if, you know, copyright can't cover what's in the public domain anyway. So to me that would sort of be a given, but I don't know, what do you think, John? Yeah, I, I think, you know, as with, you know, any publication is only copyrighted to the extent that it's copyrighted. You know, the if if you have infringing work on within a Novel, say, but uh, uh, but you but the rest of it is not infringing. You know, you you don't lose your copyright in in the larger work just because you have a a, a, a portion of it that becomes that becomes uh, uh, that that you can't defend. Okay, it looks like we have no more questions. On behalf of the officers of LRL and the Legal Services, thank you all for attending today's webinar. We'd especially like to thank Kristen and John for their helpful and informative presentations. Remember that you'll be able to access the recorded copy of today's webinar and the handout on NCSL's website within the next two weeks. Also, you'll receive a follow-up email with a survey about today's webinar, and we'd appreciate your feedback. Again, thank you for attending. You may now sign out of the webinar.